Okay, hello and warmly welcome to Moderna Museet. My name is Camilla Kahlberg and I am curator for events here in the museum. And today I have the great privilege and honor to welcome a distinguished guest that has traveled all the way from England to be here with us today. It's Dr. Amy Tobin. And I will give her a little bit of more thorough presentation shortly. I will just give you some practical information in Swedish. Hej och välkomna som sagt. Dagens föreläsning kommer att vara cirka 40 minuter lång. Och därefter öppnar vi upp för publikfrågor. Och den här föreläsningen livestreamas. Eh, så om ni vill ställa frågor så är jag väldigt tacksam ifall ni vill använda den mikrofon som jag kommer att tillhandahålla. Och om det är så att ni inte vill komma i bild under frågestunden så får ni gärna ge Dustin, vår fotograf, här ett tecken. Nu skulle jag gärna vilja be er att sätta era mobiler på ljudlöst. Och för den händelse då vi skulle behöva utrymma lokalen snabbt så är en nödutgång där och en nödutgång längst bak. Eh, you who are watching the live stream, you are more than welcome also to uh, to put questions to Ms., uh, to Dr. Amy Tobin. And uh, just write them down in the commentary field and I will uh, forward them to Dr. Tobin. So uh, now I would like to welcome uh, Amy Tobin, who is an associate professor in the Department of History of Art at the University of Cambridge. She's also a curator at Kettle's Yard, which is the uh, contemporary and modern art gallery within the university. And there she's curating contemporary programs. Amy Tobin teaches modern and contemporary art. And in her research, she's concerned with the histories of feminism and art. She has written uh, extensively on the subject and her latest book, which comes out now in October 2023 at Yale University Press London, is called Women Artists Together. Uh, the book is a study of how the liberation movement galvanized uh, a generation of women artists, and it offers a fresh perspective on the women's art movement and considers how it was shaped by collaboration and togetherness. For the exhibition catalogue Monica Sjö, The Great Cosmic Mother, uh, Amy Tobin has contributed with an essay uh, on Monica Sjö's communist, uh, cosmic feminism. In her essay, Tobin develops her thoughts about the accusations of blasphemy and the censorship that Sjö encountered when exhibiting her painting God Giving Birth, that is from 1968. Monica Sjö's experiences led her to the community of a women's liberation movement in the 1970s. And in 1979, uh, 79, sorry, she organized a touring group exhibition for women artists that was called Women Magic, celebrating the goddess within us, which put women's art in new, into new contexts. They could meet with new audiences and far from the normative criteria of artistic value and success. In her lecture, Amy Tobin will discuss spirituality, women's rights and censorship in art history with Monica Sjö's cosmic feminism as her starting point. So please give Amy Tobin a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for being here and also thank you for the invitation to speak on the occasion of this important and utterly fantastic exhibition. Um, congratulations to everyone who had a part in realising it. So over the next 40 minutes, I'm going to read a talk of some speculative thinking in five parts, which begins with a quotation. Part one. Can we not relate? In the decade before the painter's massacre of 1943, radical feminist and anarchist ideas were spreading rapidly across the country, a trend generally attributed to the popularity of Emma Goldman's speeches and policies. Nowhere were these beliefs more apparent or more extremely held 
than among young artists. Young men who might have otherwise pursued careers as painters and sculptors were pushed towards arts administration. And if they still wanted to work with their hands, then working as an assistant to a female artist was understood to be the most logical option. The belief that the feminine perspective was the only necessary perspective was becoming commonplace at the time, and male artists pursued careers with the burden of explaining or accounting for the global history of male violence and destruction. That is, men could only make work about being men. Few took on the task, and those who did were often ridiculed. This recantation of our recent history alerts us to the revolutionary transformations of the mid-20th century, although from a particular pers perspective. The author of this passage deems the surrealist painter Dorothea Tanning's Death of the Patriarch series, and I'm quoting again, in which she used her lover as a human paintbrush as the epitomic work of this period. She says this amid, amid a biography focused on the shape-shifting masquerades of the artist known as X. But are there not others we could draw on as exemplary of the possibilities opened up by the end of patriarchy, rather than only those who mark or even rejoice in its demise? Can we not, in fact, proffer the future-oriented artwork of the famous polymath Monica Je, who we are gathered here today to celebrate, as the artist of that moment, the one who showed others another way of life, who not only transformed art making away from the evolving game of art about art, but who channeled a spirit of liveliness in her work that was the shared project of Goldman's anarchist anti-capitalism. Can we not say, in fact, that Schur transformed Goldman's project into an eco-anarcho-feminism, registering not solely the modern oppression wrought via the family, but also the world historical violence in the suppression of and alienation from the natural? While we now progress in our rewriting of art historical and political narratives and theories, how might we extend our perspective beyond the subject? beyond the human. In so doing, how might we take account of those histories and figures that remain untethered from scholarly accounting and critical fantasy, even if they enjoy unprecedented popular attention? Another way to ask this is, why are we still so fixated on a select number of practices? Why does more ink spill over the analytic strategies of seriality, doubling, appropriation and irony than sincerity, belief, enchantment and imagination? Are these not two faces of the same coin, both seeking the other side of the underneath? Can we not humble ourselves? Can we not admit our interconnection with the world? Can we not relate? Part two, e.g. In her book on Emma Goldman, the feminist theorist Claire Hemings argues for approaching historical figures through a series of archives. There is the person's work, their public texts and presentations, then there are their intimate relations, their letters and journals, the record of their living in the world. Third, there is the critical archive that is the writing about their work and them. For Hemings, Goldman is an emblematic figure for thinking about the critic or the historian's varied relationships to these materials and the strange and often conflicting, Hemings would say ambivalent, persona that they leave us with. Failing to deal with, um, with the ambivalence and all the imperfections as well as glories that make up a life, risk, she says, crystallizing unreal unrealistic expectations on historical figures forcing the values of one moment onto another. In doing this work, we risk bringing some things forward while leaving others behind, and as such, selecting our history to suit the present. As it is, Hemings offers up the imaginative archive as a remedy. This allows us, she says, to imagine the past and the present differently, because articulating a feminist politics of ambivalence means foregrounding gaps and fissures in the existing archives, rather than taking them as signals of absent evidence, 
and positions instead the historian as a deeply serious writer and reader of fiction. In Goldman's case, this means refracting the sometimes uncomfortable archival truths, including her cruel dismissals of other women as ignorant and naive, her lack of attention to the multiple facets of racialized violence, her halting, unsure, romantic and sexual attachments to other women, or her consuming, distracting love affairs with men, and reading them against the grain as prefigurative of the freedom and universal kinship against conventional patriarchal marriage bonds that she espoused in her public writing. Imaginative readings then allow what wasn't yet there and what couldn't yet be said to take shape. For Hemings, this is about following the thread of what she calls the utopian desire for another future grounded in a different past. It's about using what we have in the present to look again and trace both what already existed in minor ways against the norm and what was dreamt of. To quote Hemings again, the imaginative archive prioritizes subjective and collective responsibility to generate living alternatives to the deadening modes of representation we see around us. Emma Goldman is the example, e.g. Part three, living alternatives. Emma Goldman was also an example for Monica Scher. Goldman appears in numerous works. Her words are repeated on Scher's posters, while a figural form of her face is one of the only modern historical personages across her oeuvre. Goldman also shaped Scher's early politics providing the example for a productive combination of anarchist anti-capitalism, pacifism and sexual politics, which was elaborated and expanded on first in relation to women's liberation organizing and then goddess feminism and spiritual practice, which in turn extended towards anti-nuclear campaigning and environmental movements. In these ways, Scher took Goldman's projects in new directions, and we could say, thinking with Hemings, that she realized another future, grounded in Goldman's different past. Scher's work and her life project, then, could be that very imaginative archive that generates living alternatives. At the start of this talk, I quoted from another imaginative archive, Catherine Lacey's recent novel, Biography of X. In Lacey's reimagined art history, women artists are the inheritors of creative experiment in an alternative 20th century America following the assassination of Marcel Duchamp, Alexander Calder, Vasily Kandinsky, and Jackson Pollock. This is what she calls the Painter's Massacre of 1943. These events are, are precipitated by Emma Goldman's rise to power and a concomitant civil war that split the liberal states of the North and Southern conservatives. In Goldman's North, North America, that is, women gain enfranchisement and equality, same-sex marriage is legalized, and wealth accumulation is moribund. Lacey reveals the details of this world tantalizingly with a kind of slow pleasure in unpacking retributive alternatives, as well as sobering horror at other geometries of violence. The separatist South is shown to be a place of extreme gender suppression and state paranoia, while the North is still organized into family units with all the associations of property, genealogy, and elite prestige that attend them. There are limits to what is realizable in Lacey's world. The fictional imaginative archive can also be ambivalent. So Biography of X gives me a starting point for an extended fiction or perhaps I mean an imaginative experiment where we don't linger on historical erasures or painful obscurity and instead shift our focus onto the richness of the work that is there. While I don't want to ignore the realities of women artists' place in the art worlds of the 20th and 21st century or the specific difficulties she encountered and elsewhere I focused on both extensively, 
I want to shift away from those deadening representations that in their repetition often force us to restate neglect, misunderstanding and dismissal. Instead, I'm wondering if we can create a living alternative for thinking with Shu's work where we find another present from her different past, a prefigurative possibility for relationality that asks for a revolutionary approach to life. Approaching Sha in this way might also allow us to think through and beyond some of the ambivalence her work attracts within feminist and queer contexts. The figure of the goddess in Sha's work and in the work of other artists has attracted a range of responses from awe and devotion to requisite acknowledgement, scepticism and outright critique. Sher's commitment to painting and image making has also meant her work has attracted less critical attention than her peers working in photography, performance, moving image or craft. All media more readily associated with a break from patriarchal definitions of artistic value. Add to this her interest in figurative painting, a mode usually restricted in European and American contexts to surrealist mythologies at best and at worst didactic realism. Taken together, these elements situate Sher within an enchanted sincerity and to far remove from the expanded field that defines art after 1960, running the gamut from deconstructionist irony to structuralist romanticism. To take Sher's work seriously, we must also move beyond the living alternative proposed in Lacey's biography of X, which unwraps the solo biography form via the fictional artist X who constructs and performs multiple identities, authoring masterpieces across genre and fooling her audiences along the way. Lacey's X is influenced by artists including Eleanor Antin and Sophie Cowell, her project and Lacey's project concern the plurality of identity, evasion and unknowability. And this is as recognisable a theme for a successful art practice in mid-century New York in our world as it is in Lacey's alternative. Sher's work presents a different challenge away from biography or individuality and towards the possibility of a living alternative on a social scale. It requires rethinking uneven and complex relationships beyond empowerment for a single group defined by either identity or ideology. This is a strand of thinking I also develop um, in the essay I wrote for the catalogue that accompanies this exhibition. I called this tendency Sher's cosmic feminism taking inspiration from her invocation of the great cosmic mother in her classic study of goddess spirituality, which was subsequently expanded uh, with the poet and scholar Barbara Moore in 1987. While Sher sought to, oh, let's go back, rediscover this ancient earth religion for a broken present, I borrowed the expansive connotations of the cosmic to qualify Sher's feminism. Here, cosmic means both vastness, a feminism that is open and accumulating, as well as otherworldly or celestial, meaning a feminism that is concerned with spiritual belief and worldly matters. Directly inspired by Sher's understanding of the cosmic mother, the cosmic feminism I wanted to describe was concerned with the sustenance of life centered on resisting the capitulation of reproduction to production. Profoundly anti-capitalist, it troubles the subsumption of daily life and lifetimes to work, which in turn uncouples social value from labor and disrupts alienation from nature. Uneven structural conditions, including racialized or homophobic violence, are integral targets in this struggle for a less damaging and precarious human experience. While other threats to existence like war or nuclear warfare must also be resisted for life on earth as for humanity. For sure, the mother was the fulcrum for this political and ethical transformation. This extended from her early politicization as a young mother, which included her advocacy for abortion, sexual freedom and better support for families, and her revelatory encounter with the goddess that offered a new system for understanding the world. 
cosmic feminism might allow us to think about life giving and life sustaining in broader terms, not disavowing the mother, but further untethering this figure from biological formations and all the connotations of bloodlines, lineage and property that flow from it. The great cosmic mother may be singular, but she also has many aspects. Schler's focus on the mother is symptomatic then of the contemporary ambivalences we might find in her work, in that it seems to emphasize a heteronormative cis binary reading of gender. But if we elaborate on her eco-anarcho-feminism, particularly the critique of the patriarchal family following Goldman and Hemming's reading of Goldman, then the mother figure becomes a signal of a different way of being in the world, where relational dynamics, both caring and withholding, are primary and not exemplified by any specifically gendered being. The cosmic mother is only differentiated from patriarchal godheads. Although against the grain of anti-reproductive threads of queer theory, this is a queer feminist mode of being because it disrupts normative social relations in radical ways against both family structures and nation states. So cosmic feminism is earthly rather than geopolitical, but also celestial, otherworldly. It's a pattern for a better life that might always evade us but one that can be approached, even if not fully realized in the present. Cosmic feminism is future oriented. Part four, a different past. I say this while well aware that many of Schur's paintings and much of her writing focused on bringing an occluded history into view. She seems to be looking back more than she's looking forward and as for many other artists and feminists who associated with the goddess, this perspective has brought critiques of both an empty nostalgia and primitivism. But this reading of goddess feminism, which so often also conflates spiritual belief with naive investment in an unprovable history, ignores the larger pull of unknowability. Goddess feminism, moreover, is not equivalent to goddess spirituality, Goddess spirituality takes many forms. It is a practice with a history, often entwined with neo-paganism and occultism. It is not transhistorical nor a straightforward religious institution. We can see this variance again and again in Schur's works, which give us those aspects of the Great Mother and present many topographies of goddess spiritualism from different traditions rooted in different landscapes. Goddess feminism is more specific. It describes a political intervention in religious institutions and doctrine, as well as a spiritual intervention into the politics of women's liberation. Adherence to goddess feminism in the 1970s looked to the past for evidence of suppressed cultures and practices, but part of this work was about casting doubt on the ubiquity of nor normative ways of thinking and being structured by uneven gender dynamics. Each archeological fragment, each new detail or point of analysis brought new possibilities for rereading the past as it was known and understood. In this way, goddess feminism has much in common with other imaginative, creative epistemologies, from the theoretical transgressions of Hélène Cézou and Lucy Rigoré to ideological critiques by writers as diverse as Kate Millett, Juliet Mitchell, Hortense Spillers, or Gayatri Spivak, to the possibilities evoked by Shulamith Firestone or Bell Hooks. While these and many other tendencies within feminism have attracted serious and sustained attention, much thinking around goddess feminism has been discounted or situated as tantamount to superficial, cultural, rather than revolutionary change. It's also called out for being separatist or biologically essentialist. And one of the most famous texts to announce the move away from the goddess and to forge a path from the politics of the 1970s into the 1980s was Donna Haraway's A Cyborg Manifesto, 
In this essay, Haraway imagines a networked feminism occupied by the techno-human speculative figure of the cyborg who is capable of blasphemously transforming social relations rooted in rigid, discipline-bound ways of thinking. Haraway offers the cyborg as a remedy to what she sees as a problematically fixed, organic subject to feminism, woman, presumed to be white, perhaps heterosexual, definitely cis, and probably financially secure. The cipher for this woman is the goddess. In one concluding sentence, Haraway says, I'd rather be a cyborg than a goddess. Haraway's identification with the cyborg over the goddess is a call for feminist solidarity across difference. She draws inspiration for it from speculative fiction, from the writing of Audre Lorde and Chela Sandoval, who has also traced an unacknowledged debt in that text to Bushi Yamashita. Um, a cyborg manifesto also registers the impact of deconstructionist and postmodern thinking in the late 1970s and 80s, which precipitated a critical approach to notions of authenticity, originality and truth even though I would argue that many adherents of goddess feminism were more invested in the possibilities afforded by it than they were in nostalgically reconstructing a lost past. Crucially, there was also a growing scepticism around the affects that these practices might elicit. Ritual performances that were once received positively within and without the women's art movement for their disruption, catharsis, and Dionysian spirit came to be seen as lacking a critical apparatus. Many of the artists active in the 1970s who gained critical attention in the 80s and beyond instead deployed a version of what Laura Mulvey called negative aesthetics. This analytic work, often informed by psychoanalysis, ideology critique or semiotics, sought an engaged viewer who joined in the political work of interrogating the present via the reception of often complex, difficult artworks. Mary Kelly's postpartum document is the off-cited example for this tendency. Its exchange of representational figuration of motherhood for empirical investigation is key. And Griselda Pollock described these tendencies in the British context in her essay, Screening the 70s, which acknowledges the significance of theoretical writing in the journal Screen, particularly that informed by Bertolt Brecht, to feminist practice in the UK. Screen was where many artists, such as Mary Kelly, and writers including Mulvey, published their work. These were the ideas circulating adjacent to the context in which Scher was working, but her art, writing and exhibition making are usually considered separately. Often, Scher is invoked as a figure of importance to the earlier 1970s. It's the censorship of God giving birth at St. Ives or the police obstruction of images of woman power at Swiss Cottage Library that enter into the historical record, marking the boundaries for the cultural struggle of the women's art movement that, is, that was then taken up and advanced by others. Her subsequent work, activism and widely touring exhibitions are marginalised even within these histories. And yet it was Scher's response to the events at Swiss Cottage Library namely her organisation of the widely attended group meeting to discuss women's art, that accelerated and in some cases catalyzed collectivity among artists and writers in 1970s London. Griselda Pollock has described this event as a threshold for the formation of the Women's Art History Collective, a grouping of young scholars who developed feminist critiques of art and visual culture outside their academic institutions. The Women's Art History Collective, alongside other groups, defined much of the critical discourse around what they called images of women that took shape in theoretical venues like Screen, eventually. But Scher wasn't just a forerunner or a catalyst. Her writing on the revolutionary power of women's art, which also emerged through collaborative contexts, paralleled these critical strategies, sharing and investment in the significance of art and culture to the social world. 
just as Kelly, Mulvey and Pollock each made arguments that underscored the ways images of women in art and popular culture constructed feminine norms in relation to masculine power, so should demanded we think beyond the limits of a patriarchal society to create space for an alternative. Importantly, this shared awareness branched with the artists and thinkers associated with screen, refining their critical tools beyond the question of positive and negative representation moving towards understanding processes of sexual differentiation enabled by art and visual culture. They did not believe in an alternative. Schur, by contrast, broke with the dynamic circulatory logics of contemporary image culture and sought out new modes of feminist relation, prefigurations of a post-revolution feminist future that manifested figurally in her art. And this is what we see in these early canvases, which are populated but not representational of any named subject or event. They don't obey single point perspective, giving us an illusion of real space or real struggle, nor do they appeal to the compositional arrangements of the mass movement and socialist realist muralism or canvas painting, or even to the diagrammatic organization of contemporary artists like Faith Ringgold. These early paintings bring their figures, who are often oriented differently, together onto a single plane, like a series of disconnected appearances summoned through the same vision. Although not representations of any particular group, which we see elsewhere in feminist art making, Scher's paintings signal the possibilities opened up by her actual participation in feminist groups and collectives from the late 1960s onward rather than register the significance of her feminist sisters, as others did, as we see in Edelson and in Slay's work, she imagined the liberated ends to which feminist organizing, with its emphasis on autonomy from family or professional milieu, were the means. The translation of these figures onto posters and as illustrations in feminist publications allowed them to proliferate, often becoming more abstract or emptied to outline only, waiting to be filled up. And unlike many theoretical approaches to sexual difference formulated in the 1970s, Scher was less focused on the dynamics of desire that cast people into active subjects and passive objects than in the affordances of an anarchist-inspired reorganization of social relations in the spirit of Emma Goldman's notion of universal kinship. Um, this, of course, is the unfixing of gendered roles and expectations displacing um, power dynamics for relations of erotic desire and loving care. In many of the subsequent paintings that invoke goddess cultures, Scher brings together uh, ancient mythic and even symbolic apparitions, often already figurally mediated in cross-cultural trans-historical configurations that have very little relationship to any single tradition. To me, this is the practice of manifesting a different past, which corresponds with those living alternatives condensing onto the earlier works. It's almost as though she realized she needed to rethink history as she was remaking her future. A revolutionary potentiality needed a past riven with known unknowns. Again, to approach Scher's project in this way returns us to the ambivalences of art and feminist histories, including hope, sincerity and liveliness. It offers some guidance for thinking to the side of critical tools shaped by that which was once arguably the most urgent, i.e. the analysis of submerged impulses of an increasingly pervasive popular image culture, or those images that seem to approach and therefore dictate the real. But perhaps this also speaks to the conditions of modern secularism shaped by enlightenment rationality that is only just giving way to spirituality, mysticism and belief again. If she seems untimely, we could instead read her life and work as an act of resistance to the conditions of her time. She literally shows us this in the paintings that appear on marches and demos and on the protest banners she paints 
Her art elaborates the imaginary possibilities of politics, but Schur is really less untimely than operating on a different timeline. Increasingly, her feminism was less concerned with the immediate goals of seeking opportunities for women or women artists, or about understanding the inculcation of subjects into uneven geometries of power in the present, but about intervening in the centuries-long disruption of planetary ecologies. Schur's goddess painting, with all their condensations of multiple historical references, direct us to rescale our historical perspective while her invocation of ancient landscapes suggests an even deeper geological time. Part five, the cosmic mother. Perhaps then, critical theory and mainstream politics are only just catching up with Sher. As climate crisis movements interrupt business as usual, and eco-critical approaches move from the peripheries of the humanities and sciences to the center, so the need to refocus on earthly matters becomes more urgent. Scher's life and work provide a convincing model for combining political activism with epistemological change. Her work shows us a world modelled by earthly systems of interrelation. To understand this is to recognise our interdependency and the organisation of those relations and taxonomies that reach far beyond the structures of power in capitalist society is still riven by colonial inequality. I'm suggesting that Scher's work does this by bringing diverse symbols, um, landscapes, elements and beings together onto the planes of her paintings. And while it's tempting to read these as rooted in specific sites or telling us specific histories, I think there's something more visionary at play. These paintings are akin to speculative visions, usually made without prior composition, capturing images and ideas circulating from many traditions and across Scher's practice. She is a medium or channel through which different epistemological forms take shape. As I discussed in my catalogue essay, her receptiveness to such radical thinking was heightened by her use of psilocybin mushrooms, which she described as a resource presented by the great mother goddess for heightened vision. So, although she makes no mention of Sher, Donna Haraway does make a comparative cognitive leap in her recent work, Staying with Trouble, Making Kin in the Cuthal Scene, which advances on her substitution of lateral networked cyborg connections for what she read as the linearity of goddess revisionism in a cyborg manifesto. In this work, got concerned with ecology, Haraway argues against the language of climate crisis and asks us to stay with the trouble, that is, to realise the long temporalities of ecological degradation and the necessity of living within or adapting to the mess. Haraway asks us to think about life proceeding in the dark and deathly terrain of the Cuthal scene, where all the hallmarks of humanist relationality, uh, humanist rationality, I should say, and morality a sacrifice for new, more than human kinships, structures that connect via tentacles and tails. With this, Haraway proposes a profound break with Western epistemologies, um, and, normal, and notably what she describes as the anthropocentric, anthropocentric sky gods of the Olympiad, or the knowledge systems dictated by attention to the constellations, to allow us to regenerate in the compost. Sure, by contrast, wants us to keep looking up as well as down and within. She brings forth the great cosmic mother in all her aspects and exemplars to model an alternative ethics of care. In Haraway's terms, this is a form of conservatism, evident also in recent attempts to theorize a worldview via Gaia or Mother Earth. But Sher's invocation of the great cosmic mother does not so much reproduce the logic of the mother as a target for violent disregard, as Haraway suggests of Gaia, then presents us with an unknowable, because always morphing across cultures and mythologies, diffuse, because present everywhere, but not fixed in human, animal or elemental form, spirit. 
the great cosmic mother, as she condenses onto Zhe's paintings, does not take on the broader, does not take on the burden of her children's ignorance. She patterns a resilient life. She reaches beyond any biological mother. She is supranatural. But let's take Haraway's desire to go beyond Gaia and the Earth Mother as an example of the kinds of contemporary feminist ambivalence that I introduced earlier, which scoff at sincerity, hopefulness, and liveliness. Perhaps Haraway's argument pushes us to face down requisite truths of a broken, colonized world, but it also raises serious questions for population and reproduction, as many of her critics have noted. Moreover, such feminist ambivalence around the mother also risks attenuating the political potential of, a generational, of generational relationships and the troubling, pleasurable messiness those dynamics elicit, as the reflex to the queer chosen family might suggest. This is one aspect of 1970s feminism that is often missed. Mothers are important and they can represent the strange configurations of selflessness and despair, concern and joy that make up life and are equally necessary for struggle. The strangeness of the mother relation is taken up by diverse artists in the 1970s. And to end, let's look again to the critical praxis around screen that supported not only Mary Kelly's postpartum document, which tracked her relationship to her son as he grew and entered the social world in his acquisition of language, but also Laura Mulvey and Peter Wallen's 1977 film, Riddles of the Sphinx. Often taken to be a signal work of 1970s counter cinema, a movement associated with arid films that demand an active thinking rather than a passive entertained viewer, Riddles of the Sphinx also went beyond what Oliver Fuke called the scorched earth theoreticism of this tendency. Nicholas Helm Grovas argues that the film's six parts comprising, among other elements, critical exegesis, psychedelic imagery, and a narrative in which women mobilize for nursery provision, connected emerging discourses in counter cinema and feminist organizing with what Mulvey called an emotional, uncerebral side, akin to the experience of caring for small children. Helm Grovas emphasizes the importance of this combination of criticality and emotion in the film, highlighting Mulvey's phrase, passionate detachment, to explain the dialectical work of this seemingly contradictory pairing. As he writes, counter cinema remains oppositional in Riddles of the Sphinx, but is no longer only a counterpoint. Its negative critical impulse is connected to a desire to build something new, alternative pleasures, a new language of desire, different modes of spectatorship and filmmaking. For Helm Grovas, these alternative pleasures are Mulvey's remaking of avant-gardism from negation, as well as from a straightforward feminist politics of identification. As the title of the film suggests, Riddles of the Sphinx plays with unknowability. The riddling Sphinx, to quote Helm Grovas, provides a productive site of resistance that breaks with the traffic in known signs. The Sphinx appears in the film in numerous ways, as both riddles about the Sphinx and riddles posed by the Sphinx, and it offers, as Mulvey writes, a poetic confrontational discourse that gets away from a logical, expositionary kind of language. The Sphinx, then, stands in for what cannot be known, what escapes meaning, and as such, even the kind of gendered meanings that are produced by what Griselda Pollock, uh, Griselda Pollock has called familial script, or those psychoanalytic structures that equate the mother with lack. Fisher, too, the Sphinx was important. In her recounting of her art making, she describes the image of the Sphinx used on this poster as one of the first images she found of a feminine deity which caught her eye from a book owned by her then partner. She copied this image, rescaled and reproduced it, tagging it as a great mother Sphinx, combining it with exposition from her anarchist manifesto, Women are the Real Left, Why Do We, towards an anarchist politics, written with Keith Motherson. 
This mother is not the codified figure organised by a lack and plenitude that Pollock describes as unconsciously shaping gendered understanding through visual culture, nor what she calls some final validation of the nurturing mother that haunts us all as a fantasy. Scher's great mother sphinx, her great cosmic mother, her returning goddess, stand in for the death of violent patriarchy and of human exemplarity, as well as a different past for living alternatives. She models a system of interrelation and cooperation, a necessarily different way of thinking and being that must be sought, or else, as she suggests, no one will survive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy Tobin. That was so interesting. No problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do we have questions from the audience already? We don't have questions from the live stream yet, but uh, I repeat that you are more than welcome to write your questions down and I will forward them, them, forward them to Amy. Uh, I was thinking about um, something that struck me a little bit, or that I, I've been thinking about when it concerns Monica Hoyer's work. Uh, I think it's difficult to imagine a contemporary artist today that would merge spirituality and uh, politics in their work. Mm. Uh, that's hard to imagine. Do you agree with that? I don't know, actually. I think, I think there's lots of artists who are stepping into that terrain, um, or trying to. But finish your question. Uh, but how was it perceived then uh, by art critics, for example? Was there, was there any criticism about that? Or, uh, because spirituality has always been, looked, been fr a bit frowned upon uh, from art critics. Uh, how, how was it perceived then? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, not not well, I would say. <laughs> um, I mean, it really depends um, at which point you, you sort of catch an art critic. So there is a point in the 1970s where some art critics are actually very invigorated by turns to um, historic mythologies, to spirituality, to the land. They're, they're quite excited by the possibilities that this opens up. Um, and they're really interested in it for, for a sense of what I said, you know, I mentioned the Dionysian spirit of these practices. So you do find some critics who follow that through. And I mean, another trajectory there is, is Lucy Lippard, who is very interested in these um, multiple turns to what she calls prehistory in the 1970s. And she explores this in a book called Overlay. But actually then, a lot of critics begin to turn away from that and begin to be quite skeptical of spiritual tendencies, primarily, I think, because they don't really understand this kind of will to belief that artists are espousing. And that's particularly true, I think, for Monica Scher, but also for people like Mary Beth Edelson, who was practicing in New York in sort of roughly contemporary to Monica, and they were both in the goddess issue of, of heresies. Edelson actually edited that issue of the feminist publication. Um, but what's interesting about Mary Beth Edelson is, is many critics, and her work received a lot of critical attention, will say, you know, Mary Beth Edelson, adherent of goddess feminism. You know, Mary Beth Edelson believes in the goddess. And she refutes this. She writes back to the critics often in her archive. You see these letters where she's saying, like, what? no, <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm using this goddess mythology. I'm invoking it in my work. It's not a sort of direct relationship of belief for her. Obviously, it's different for Monica Scher. But I think there's this tendency to just kind of write it off, to not probe it or explore it. So, Sorry. That's OK. A Thank you very much. It's also interesting how you draw a parallel between Donna Haraway and Monica Hoa. It's mm. really interesting to hear about. Someone wants to ask a question or a comment in the lecture? Uh, and nothing from the live stream yet. Um, um, but I was also thinking about another aspect. I mean, Monica Hoa can be 
very personal in her paintings uh, when it comes to her sons. Mm -hmm. She lost two sons in one year's time, was that correct? That's close together, yeah. Close together, yeah. Um, was the paintings that she was showing publicly, or was it more for her private um, processing uh, of these horrible accidents, do you think? Well, I mean, I think, well, I think she did show them publicly. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I don't think it's easy to make a distinction between works of different subject matter for Monica, as far as I understand anyway. Um, I think she was keen to kind of use art making as a form of processing her experience, the knowledge that she accrued, what she couldn't find out. You know, this is what I mean by kind of visionary painting practice, something that, you know, allows you to explore what isn't kind of otherwise existing around you, what doesn't manifest otherwise. And so when she's mourning, the paintings provide a space for her to mourn in a very particular way. And that, of course, has a personal um, importance, but it's not limited to that, of course. And I suppose for those who can read or find the portraits of her sons in the work, it's moving in one particular way. But they register on many different levels, I think. And I mean, I think that's how we should always take an artist's work, both for its specificity and for its um, generality. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, now we have one question here. Come with the microphone. Thanks so much, Amy. I really enjoyed that talk. I was thinking about where you had the relevance of her work, particularly the posters. I really like the directness of her politics mm. um, in her artwork. And um, do you see a kind of relevance to what's going on right now with women's rights, particularly in America? And, and, you know, how is, is, is part of Monica's work coming back partly because women's rights are being kind of paired back in lots of places. So I just wanted to ask about that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, I find really interesting about Monica's work and, and the reception that it gets um, and I've sort of known and been thinking about it for maybe 10 years. And I think when I first started out, you know, no one was really speaking about her work, or maybe they would speak about God giving birth, but fleetingly. Um, and there is a kind of like, you know, queasiness around it. And maybe that's to do with, you know, what Sarah Ahmed calls like killjoy feminism, the sense of like things being too visceral or too angry or causing, you know, bringing things up that we don't actually want to think about. Um, but, you know, now we're at a point of, you know, crisis, right? Or that crisis has been taken on a new urgency and a new present in our everyday. And I think Monica's work gives shape and form to that, has done for some people, has done for many decades. And for those who are just coming to it now, if it can give that shape and form, provide some kind of anchor, then I think that's great. And it's, you know, I mean, we were talking earlier about people taking these images and using them on protests in the contemporary moment. I mean, I think that's very true to Monica's spirit. And I would encourage everyone to do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are a lot of um, artists from the 1970s who feel that way also you know, who, who want their work to circulate outside of museums as well as having places in, in these spaces as well. Thank you. Someone else? Mm, I know there doesn't seem to be any more questions, so then I think it's maybe time for us to... Yeah, of course, <laughs> uh, please. Uh, I'm just uh, curious about her relationship to, to the New Age movement, mm. the, the many uh, similarities. Uh, how, how the, I, I, I read she didn't like <laughs> to be seen as a part of that. 
how, how did she relate to <laughs> this <laughs> new age thing? Um, yeah, movement? well, I mean, I think the, the issue with a lot of manifestations of new age, of the new age movement of, you know, neo-paganism and other things like that is that they, they have their own structures of elitism and membership and recruitment. And, you know, it's not um, a world that's radically open, right, in the way that I think Monica Usher was interested in pursuing life and spirituality and politics. And even in some cases, you know, in the UK and, and with the relationship between uh, neo-paganism in the UK and France, for instance, it's highly nationalistic. So, you know, there are kind of key facets of some of those movements, not all, that really conflict, I would say, with like her Goldman-esque anarchism. But she was also related to and part of goddess cultures and um, different spiritual groups. And, you know, I think she found the shapes and the structures and the context that worked for her and she also shaped them and I think that's really crucial about her work I mean there's a lot to reconstruct and understand in those histories because as I say they've been sort of left to linger as some kind of oddity right off to the side but yeah but that's that would be my kind of first thought that answers your question yeah. <laughs> great So thank you so much, Amy Tobin. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for visiting us. And thank you for sharing uh, your knowledge about uh, art and feminism and Monica Sjö's work in particular. And thank you all, uh, the audience. Thank you for your uh, interesting questions. Thank you for coming. And thank you all on the live stream also. It has been great to have you today. Thank you. Thank you.